good God wants to speak into our hearts these next few weeks. I want to start a new series here with you this morning. And uh, bear with me as I get turned to the book of Galatians real quick. A uh, new series I want to start here this morning with us, uh, just entitled Three Questions. And, and as I uh, begin, let me tell you, uh, this is from a book by Pastor Rod Loy. I don't know if you've ever saw the book before or picked it up, maybe read it. As I was just kind of praying about what is it, God, you want to say to us here in September, I felt like the Lord pointed me towards this book on my shelf and uh, the concepts that are in it. And I, I think this is something that is really going to be a blessing for us these next few weeks together. Uh, God has some good things that he wants to say to us here. I believe something very, very special and uh, something that is applicable to every single one of us, no matter where you are at in your journey of faith with Jesus Christ, in this quest that you're in to follow after him, this word will speak to every one of us, whether you're at the beginning of your journey, maybe you're not even in the beginning, maybe you're still investigating, uh, or maybe you've been saved a very, very long time, this stuff will be a blessing and a help to you, uh, not because I'm saying it or it's coming from a, you know, some concepts out of a book, but because it's a scripture that we're looking at here today. But let's pray and let's see what God has to say because these next few moments are his moments with you. I hope you look at it like that. These are his moments with you. Father, we bow our heads and our hearts here today, and as we are about to uh, get into the word and see what you would say to us, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would truly let your word speak volumes in this place in these next few moments, God. I pray that every single one of us would have an ear to hear and a heart that will also obey. And Father, that you would challenge us today and that you would change us in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said... Amen and amen. Let me say this. The priority of the church is to raise lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ. We are supposed to make disciples of all men. The Great Commission talks about that very thing, doesn't it? To go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of all people. And so today, when we think about that, we have to also understand that that should shape our core values, that should shape what we do, uh, the decisions that we make as a church, the methods that we use, uh, how we live our life. It's about seeing you become a disciple of Jesus Christ and not just jump and say, hey, I'm going to be a disciple, but actually following through on that very course. I'll convince you by the end of the time, I'm hoping. But that's what God wants here. And it's safe to say, though, that in a community like ours here, that it is full of people who at some time in their life raise their hand to receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord, maybe pray to prayer to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart, maybe even walked an aisle and shook the hand of a preacher, but there are people all around us, maybe at your job, maybe neighbors where you live, maybe people you bump into at Hannaford or Walmart or wherever you might be. Their values, their life, and their habits, though, may not exactly reflect this discipleship piece that we're talking about today, though. Maybe they made a decision. I think probably one of the most grievous things I've experienced as a pastor is see somebody raise their hand and say, I need Jesus in my life on a Sunday morning, and that's the last time you ever see them in church. I've seen it happen time and time again as though that is the key. This is what I need in my life. Because a lot of people find themselves at a place in their life that maybe things are going not so good, and they say, I need God, I need church in my life. And they come to church and they hear a preacher and they raise their hand, accept Jesus and think, now I got that part of my life covered and then we're off and running doing the next thing. That's, that's the starting block. That's the starting block. From there, we've got to continue on in our relationship with the Lord because he doesn't just want to be a part of your life, he wants to be your life. He wants to be your life. You know, once you pray that prayer and once that moment's over, we are not to run right back to the way it used to be. Now he comes in 
and he redesigns your life and he redesigns everything. So our goal is not just to make converts, not just to win souls, that's a piece, but that's the beginning. Our, our goal is to truly make disciples. And we wanna see people give their hearts to Jesus, but begin this lifelong journey of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, committed to him in such a way that it will, it will affect every aspect of your life. Now the way you spend your money is different, the way you think is different, where you go on the weekends are different. Hmm? What you watch on TV might be different. What you say is different. Everything should be impacted because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And then there's people in this room. You've made that kind of decision. Some of you are maybe, like I said at the beginning, phase. I know out on the wall in the uh, foyer area, you'll see four words out there that start with B, and the first one is belong. Today, a lot of people come to church, and this kind of our strategy concept, a lot of people come to church, and they're just trying to figure out, do I fit in? Can I fit in here? They're kind of investigating. Maybe some of you are here today, you're in that phase. You're just trying to figure out, can I belong here? Is this a place for me? Is this a place that I, I get their concept? I get what the guy talks about up there wearing this pink shirt and trying to figure out this kind of thing. And you're kind of in that place. And that's cool and that's all right. And I pray you keep coming back and investigating and trying to figure this thing out because that's what happens today. And we're absolutely a-okay with that. But then we're hoping you get to the next step where a lot of people are, are at here. You're beginning to be in this place. You might say, I believe. Some of you have made that decision to believe in the Jesus that we read about in the Bible. And that is obviously a goal, but it's not the only goal that we have. So you've made a commitment. Still others have made that decision and sometime in the past that was a thing you did back then. And maybe for a while you wandered. How many had some wandering years, right? You, you made that choice, you know you need Christ, but there's been some wandering and there's been some wandering there. But I wanna tell you something, God didn't give up on you and he hasn't given up on you and he won't give up on you even though you maybe had kind of thought, well, I'm kind of giving up on him for the moment. He hasn't given up on you. Can you say amen? amen? Then there's others of you. You've been saved years and years, and that's probably a lot of us sitting in this room here. Maybe you've been putting many, many years into your relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's kind of that become idea. That's this discipleship thing. That's this growing in Christ thing. And you have formed friendships here. You have found your place in ministry. You found a place of getting involved. You're wholeheartedly determined to follow Jesus all of your life. And then there's some that have been on this journey for years. And here's the danger that people have been saved for decades and decades and decades. Sometimes they, uh, we, because I've been saved a few decades now, we can get a little cranky and a little rough around the edges. Don't look around, just kind of keep your head down. Don't point at people. Um, but there's a real danger there. But as people get older in the Lord, we actually should be getting sweeter and sweeter in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I pray that that's what we see happening as well. That this lifelong journey, this discipleship process is making us more and more and more like Christ not becoming more cranky because we've seen it all and I'm tired of seeing the same cycle. No, may we get sweeter. And that, let's not let that happen here at Wyndham Assembly. Can you say amen? amen? Now I say all this to say something very specific here today. I wanna to recognize all of us, every single one of us are at a different place in our relationship with the Lord here in this room. All at different places, been saved different amounts of years, different amounts of time. Some of us have only been going up since then. Some have had their wandering years. Some have come back and maybe wandered again and come back again. Wherever you're at, we're all on this journey. We need to stay on the journey. I just reminded of Colossians chapter two. Don't turn there. Let me throw it up on the screen for you. It says in Colossians chapter two, verses six and seven, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. What's he telling 
the readers of his letter. Paul's saying, you need to, if you've made your choice to follow Christ, you need to continue to follow him. Grow deeper in the Lord. Grow stronger in him. Yeah, we're all different people. We're all different ages. We're at different points along the journey that we're in, but we're all on the same journey. We're all going to the same place, and we're all committed to be lifelong followers of Jesus Christ, or I wanna challenge you to make that your commitment here today. Watchman Nee said this, he said, the Christian experience from start to finish is a journey of faith. It's a journey of faith for every single one of us. We might be at different places, but we can all learn from each other. We can be encouraged by each other. We can be strengthened by each other. In fact, I believe we all need somebody that's ahead of us in the journey to encourage us, and we all need to be mentoring somebody that's behind us in the journey. It keeps us accountable. It also keeps us strengthened and built up. That's a part of this process. That's why we try to say every now and again, get involved in a small group or connect or even these moments of prayer like we've had today. Connect us with one another. And what the beautiful thing is that I've enjoyed seeing here amongst us is even though there's been storms and tornadoes and there's been hurricanes in many of your different lives through this situation or that situation, I've enjoyed seeing the body surround many of you. I enjoy seeing people coming to your aid at those moments. May we continue to see that happen. That's what being a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ is about. But here we go. In this series, I want to point out that something along this series here, and we think about this series called Three Questions. It's exactly that because we're going to be looking at three questions that are in the book of Galatians here. Three questions that truthfully, regardless of where you're at in your journey of faith, you're gonna to have to answer these questions sometime. Somewhere along the way, you're gonna be confronted with them, and maybe they haven't been labeled for you, maybe you haven't heard them in the exact word form that we're gonna talk about them today, but you've already been answering these questions, but I wanna highlight them for you because you need to answer these questions because they're gonna shape how well you're doing along this lifelong journey of discipleship, and they're gonna be good questions. So regardless of who you are, where you were raised, how long you've been in the church, at some point, you need to answer these questions. These questions are key critical turning points that require your decisions. How many love making decisions? Exactly, three people. How many avoid decisions at all costs? That's the problem with discipleship because we don't like to make decisions. Here's some questions over the next few weeks we're gonna to encounter together. You're gonna to have to answer these questions. You need to look at these and think about them. So my agenda here today is to challenge you, but it's also to prepare you so that you're ready with the right answer to the questions that come up. You hear me? So before we start, I'll warn you, this might be tough for some of us, and I hope it is because I pray it's challenging. I pray it challenges you because when we're challenged, we grow. When we're challenged, we grow. If you don't bail, if you don't unplug, if you don't disconnect, don't say, I'll see you in October, don't do that. Come back next week too, all right? So it might be difficult, it might be a little confrontational, but hey, that's what good preachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to meddle a little bit, right? Amen. So why, why are we talking about it? Because we don't just need another bless me sermon. So what are we talking about here today? Is what motivates me? That's what we're talking about here today. What motivates me? Am I trying to please man or am I trying to please God? What motivates me in my life? Now there's three questions found in the book of Galatians. Let me give you a little background on the book of Galatians here if you'll allow me a few moments. Uh, the book of Galatians was a letter written by Paul uh, to a group of churches that were in a province called Galatia. It was an area that covered several hundred uh, square miles. Uh, Paul visited these churches on his first missionary journey, but Galatia was in an area where Paul had confronted a lot of problems. There were a lot of issues going on in the churches there. Mobs actually, when he was there preaching at times, were trying to corner him, beat him up, stone him, and kill him and get rid of him. And uh, after he had gone away, you know, he'd preached and established some churches. This letter was written because Jewish leaders were trying to confuse 
and unsettle the new Christian converts that were there in Galatia. So Paul wrote for two reasons, essentially. Number one, the leading Jews were saying that you can only get to heaven if you keep the law. And so the gospel of Jesus and his grace was under attack in these churches. And they were not allowing any room for the grace of God and uh, no opportunity for restoration. If you messed up, you were out. That was what these Jewish leaders were saying. So Paul wanted to correct that. And in fact, some people were taking sides. And so there was some gossip that was going on, divisions, even fighting in the church. I mean, we know this doesn't happen in the church today, but it was happening back then. Some of you are smart. And, um, but anyhow, this was going on. Another reason why he wrote, because uh, Paul's ministry itself was under attack. People were saying, who's Paul? I mean, after all, who is this guy? Who really cares about what he has to say? Why should we believe him? And so he writes about that. So as you can imagine, because of these things, the church was in trouble. They were wondering this question, who do we follow? Who do we listen to? What should we believe? How can we really please God? What does it mean to truly follow Jesus? These are great questions, great questions for them then. They're great questions for you and me today. So with so many messages out there, you might be wondering the same thing. Who do we follow? Who do we listen to? What do we believe? How can we really please God? What does it mean to be a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ? We live in a world that's full of prejudice and before the storms, that's all we were hearing on the news, prejudice and hatred and fighting and all these kinds of things. We're pressured in our world, in our culture, to think a certain way. If you don't think a certain way, you're not gonna fit in and everybody's gonna hate your guts because of it. That's the world we live in. How do we fit this? What about social media that seems to be pouring into our lives more and more and more all the time? I guarantee we read more words on Facebook and Instagram than we do in our Bibles most days. Smile, you're on candid camera. God's watching, right? But there's truth to that. People are railing about us, about how we should believe and what we should be doing. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff goes on. And then there's the Bible. You read the Bible, and here's the truth. I mean, this is the dirty little secret. Yeah, we know it's right, but I don't like it because it goes against what I want to do. Hmm? My flesh wants the exact opposite. Some say we can't even understand it, and so then we're in a real pickle. Well, in the course of the letter that Paul is writing to the Galatians, he has some key questions for them as well as us to understand. And if our goal, I'm trusting, I'm gonna lump you all in, but I know we're all at different places in the journey, but we're considering this thing. If I am gonna follow Jesus Christ, this is a lifelong goal that I'm making here for my life. If I am going to do that, I'm gonna be confronted with some difficult moments and I have to answer some difficult questions here. This one, what motivates me? Look at Galatians chapter one. We're gonna start reading in verse six down through 10. Paul writes to them and says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. I already told you this is what was going on. Verse eight, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what, you, what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed as we have said before. So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For I am now seeking, I'm sorry, let me start over because that's the key verse. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So here it is, verse 10. Maybe highlight that, write that down. The first question we grapple with as disciples of Christ, as followers of Jesus, is what motivates me? What is my motivation in life? Who moves me? What moves me? Who will I please with my life? My wife, my parents, my pastor, my church, or do I please God? Sometimes, hopefully, they sometimes coincide together. The point is this, 
We cannot effectively follow Jesus and spread the message of the gospel and influence others for Jesus if we're more concerned about what others will think of us over what God thinks of us. If we're always concerned about what others might think or what others might say, we're not gonna be very effective. Can you say amen? So this question is a real question here. Such people that are given to be weak in these areas and they're motivated by people and are they gonna be happy or are they gonna be pleased with me? If we are given to that, well, I'm motivated to make everybody happy and a lot of us would raise our hands, I'm a people pleaser. I've heard so many people say that to me through the years. This is where we can't be people pleasers. This is not an area we can say, I'll be a people pleaser, because when we're motivated by others and not the Lord, we will always, always compromise. We're gonna compromise. But if our goal is to be a lifelong follower of Christ, then we make it our aim to follow Jesus. We make it our aim to satisfy the plans that he has for me, even if it means making somebody else unhappy. This is what Paul's saying in verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. If I'm gonna be a people pleaser, these two things don't go hand in hand. They don't work together. I'm not a bondservant of Christ if I wanna make somebody else happy all the time. I wanna make Christ happy. And here's how sometimes we see people use the verse wrong. Now, as a pastor, there's been times people have come to me and said to me, hey, we need to do this or that or another thing. And my job is to do what God has for the church and for others. Can you say amen? Amen. Ouch, something. I know you're upset the Patriots lost, so sorry. Oh, I just lost you right there, didn't I? Hold on, I'll let you pray. Hmm. Hmm. Anyhow, somebody brings something to me, and if I'm not always on board, there's been times people will say, well, pastor, do you want to please men or please God? As if their idea was God's idea. And if I don't do what they want to do, then I am disobeying the Lord and I'm wrong. Well, I at that moment have to be determined what motivates me. Do I make this person happy or do I please what the Lord has for us? So will it be God or will it be his word? Will it be this person, maybe their influence, maybe even their money, maybe they tithe big dollars, who knows? I don't know. I really don't. Debbie doesn't give me a report about once a year. No, I'm just kidding. I don't don't know any of that stuff. So what we've got to understand, sincerely, what we've got to understand when people bring those things up, this scripture verse is not intended to bring condemnation or to maneuver others. This question is intended to be a personal question. This is a personal question question here. It was designed to be a question that you would ask yourself about this. You would examine your heart with this verse. Now, not so that somebody else can examine your heart for you. You know this whole plank in the eye and speck in somebody else's thing? Yeah, that's not your business. This verse is for you to say, who am I going to please? This is a personal question for you today. Whose approval are you living for? Do I live for the applause of men or do I live for the applause of God? Do I want to live so that my life just keeps people happy or do I want to keep God happy? It's a personal, a personal question intended to be personal so that you can evaluate your own heart, your own motives. This is what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he said in verse 5, examine what? Yourselves. Examine yourselves. So, our motivation in this question is personal in nature. How many of us and how many of our sins and failures could be prevented if we'd only answered this question right? How many of us have fallen into sin or strayed a little bit from the Lord because we answered this question wrong? 
It's the student who goes to a party. He knows he shouldn't be there in the first place, but he goes. And while he's there, he's confronted with friends, and all he's trying to do is really, really, really fit in with people and just gain some friends. And then he begins to compromise here and there. He might take a drink of this. He might wind up in a room with somebody just so that he can make some friends. The question, what motivates me? Who motivates me? That decision was made to please men, not self. It's the young adult who finds themselves in compromising positions with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe in a live-in situation, it's trying to make decisions there and she knows it's wrong or he knows it's wrong, but hey, this is just how things have got to work out in the culture today, this is what happens. Do you know most people that live together wind up in divorce? It doesn't help your relationship get better, it actually weakens your relationship. It's a decision, what motivates you? It's the business person who compromises, maybe lowers their standards just a little bit because after all, we've got to network with people or after all, I've got to get the sale. So whatever it takes to get the sale, whatever it takes to make it happen, I might tell a little white lie. No, what motivates us? It's the person who spends money to impress people you don't even like. What motivates us? There's one we've heard many times. The conversation was going great, and then it just took a turn. And all of a sudden, we were talking about sister so-and-so, and and we were telling this story, and I didn't want to gossip, and I hated to hear the things, but I didn't want to bother people, so I didn't confront it. I just listened. I kept my mouth shut. No, that's called gossip, and that's called listening to it, and you're an added benefit to that thing. I want to tell you, those are things we've got to avoid. I told you it might be a little sticky today. It's the parents who worry so much when their kids are off to college. They're afraid that their son or daughter might be faced with questions and make wrong decisions. We wonder, what are they going to do? What motivates them? You follow people to the wrong places, doing the wrong things. Paul tells us this. This is a question we have to answer. We have to think about this. And you know what? You can't just wait it out. When I was a youth pastor, I always would talk to our kids about some real difficult things and some scrupulous situations. And I would say, don't wait until you're in the situation to make that decision. Make that decision now so you know how you'll respond when the situation happens. So here I am talking to the older youth. Don't wait until you're in a situation. Determine now how you will live as a business person, as a husband, as a wife, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, as a young adult, as a young man or a young woman. Determine now how you're gonna live your life so that when you get questioned, what motivates you? You know the answer. When that moment comes, you know how you'll respond in the situation because you know it is Christ that you're trying to please and nobody else. We have to make those decisions. I know we're all different people. we come from different backgrounds and different experiences in our life, but here's the truth. This gospel that we're preaching is not a relative gospel. It sticks to some and not to others. It is for everybody. It's absolute truth. Can somebody say amen? This applies to every single one of us in all of our situations. So what we have to understand is that there's different voices in our life. Yeah, no doubt about it. But which one will you listen to? Which one will motivate you? Which standard are you going to live by? And you know what? When we begin to try to please everybody, we will wear ourselves out trying to make everybody happy. The monk, John Lydgate, was noted for once saying this, you can please some of the people all of the time and you can please all the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time. Bottom line is, you can't make people happy. I, I, one of my friends on Facebook uh, had this little sign he held up and it was, he's taking a picture, it was put on Facebook. Now Facebook is like Instagram because all there is pictures on there, video, that kind of thing. But it said, if you wanna make people happy, sell ice cream, don't be a leader. The only people making somebody happy are the people that own dugout, right? Everybody there is happy, right? Am I right, Jolene, right? They're just happy when you're buying ice cream. But man, it's not always happy days standing in this place. 
not always happy days when you've got to make decisions that don't please people. But our priority as believers in Jesus Christ is to please God. Here's another misinterpretation of this verse that we sometimes run into. It's the other extreme. People might say uh, to another person, I don't have to worry about what you think. I don't care what you think. I'm pleasing God. And if you don't like it, you're wrong. It's your problem. Well, I don't think God wants us to be belligerent and ignorant either. Would you agree? So this question is also very practical in nature. Think about it a little bit more like this. The feel and the tone of it that Paul was trying to come across was not with judgment. It was just a fact for your personal life, for your intention. Not to get an attitude and treat other people bad, but it was a real question. If you look at uh, maybe some of you have read Max Lucado's book, um, The Applause of Heaven. Have you heard of that book before? It's about the Beatitudes. And uh, in that, he makes this statement. He says, it is what you always dreamed but never expected. It's having God as your dad, your biggest fan, your best friend. It's having the king of kings in your cheering section. It is hearing the applause of heaven. Our goal as a believer in Jesus Christ is not about making people mad. Instead, it's about making God happy. It's about pleasing him. And could we ask ourselves this question? I would love, hey, yeah, to have people applaud me. I, I love that people are happy when things go well. I think that's awesome. It's great. Sometimes it should happen, but it doesn't always happen. But I much more enjoy, and I hope that you do as well, the applause of God, the joy that it brings him when you do what he's asked you to do. And you know what? You can choose that. In fact, you do choose it. You either choose it by choice or by default, one or the other. But we should choose the applause of heaven. Talk about practical. Here's a pra practical way for you to think about things. When you're making a decision about how you should spend your money, when you're making a decision about uh, maybe how you should spend your time, maybe the friendships that you're forming, maybe the habits that you're forming, maybe the priorities that you're making for your life. Ask yourself this question. Will this make me happy? Will this make another person happy? More importantly, will this please God? Will this decision please God? Will it cause God to say, bravo, good job? Hmm? Begin to filter decisions in your life through that. Does this please the Lord? Is he saying, that a boy, that a girl? Hmm? Will this make God clap for me? Is God clapping with some of the decisions that we make? Does he approve of it? When you get out of bed this morning and said, I'm going to church, I think he's happy about that. When you wrote out that check to give maybe to Convoy of Hope and help those that are in need because of the hurricanes, I think God had a boy. Do you follow me this morning? Yeah. That's what God is wanting to do. But we have to make those decisions. You see, if you apply that small, simple step, that question, that test, it will begin to change the way you steward your life. It will begin to shape your life. It will begin to take you on the journey that God has for you to take in your life. How you steward your money, what you're doing on the weekends, how you navigate your dating relationships, your working relationships, your marital relationships, your attitude at work, your response to conflict in life, or how you even just treat others. So before we make any decisions, we need to find direction from God so that we can respond to that, so that we can get a standing O from the Lord because we want to please him above any and above all. Remember, ask yourself, am I doing this in order to gain the approval of people or am I doing this to please the Lord? And I'm not trying to be too simplistic here when I say this, but many people would avoid their biggest mistakes and failures if they would simply slow down and ask that question. 
And if we're trying to be a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ who makes a difference, we have to decide, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Who am I trying to make happy? Am I striving to please men? If I'm trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Being a man pleaser doesn't go hand in hand with being a Christ follower. Do you read that or am I just seeing that? If I'm living my life to make people happy, I, I can't be a bondservant of Christ. And you might be thinking, well, that's not a very good deal then. Everybody's gonna be mad at me. Everybody's gonna hate my guts. Nobody's gonna like being around me. That's not at all what I'm saying. Look at this verse real quickly. Proverbs 16, 7 says, when the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Is that on the slide? Click. Next slide, please, sweetheart. There you go. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. That's an awesome verse. Now, when we live our lives to please God, I know it's not gonna make everybody happy, but what it does say is we will have peace still. He will bring peace. Do you see that? When you try to win the approval of men, let me pull this together. When you live your life to please everybody, you're probably going to fail, right? How many have tried to please people and it still never worked? Right, so there's some witnesses here today. It still didn't work, it didn't happen. So when you're trying to please God, we say, hey, hey, how you doing today? Welcome to church, right? If we're trying to please God, it may make somebody else unhappy. So we kind of shy away from that. We wanna make people happy, but we've found we can't often make people happy. So then we're making who happy? Nobody happy half the time. And we don't like that. Nobody's happy, and then you're on Mission Impossible. No one's happy, right? You can't say enough, you can't do enough, you can't give enough to make anybody happy. And the bottom line is, if we settle with this fact, we can't make people happy, then who should you point towards making happy? If I can't make people happy anyhow, who should I wanna make happy? God. Because if I can't win for losing anyhow with people, and that's probably half the truth right there, why wouldn't I make God being happy my goal? And in that, this question prioritizes for us who we should be making happy. If I run the risk of not making anybody happy anyhow, why not make God happy? because most people are unpleasable anyhow. Isn't that a revelation for you today? Here's what Proverbs 29, 25 says. It says, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts the Lord will be exalted. Here's another one, James 1, 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I can't imagine, you know, that verse popped in my mind as we think about trying to make man happy, trying to make God happy. A double-minded man, you're unstable. So while we futilely try to make people happy, we can see this first question that Paul confronts us with, what motivates us, who motivates us, should reset our priorities today. It's really an easy choice. Live to please God and God alone. And when you live to please God and God alone, ultimately you will gain the respect of people. And they will live at peace with you because they see you are pleasing God. You're living by the beat of a different drum. You follow me today? When you live your life to please men, you're going to lose their respect because they know you can, you can be pulled around by them. They can use you like a puppet. And when you see it like that, you know there's no choice anyhow. The only right choice is to choose to please God. And it's easy when you step back and look at it to say, that's the one I want to please. I must please the Lord because I want God to be clapping for me. So I want to remind you again this question, what motivates you? What motivates you today? Do you live to please God? Do you live to please self? Or do you live to please the Lord? You've got to be choosing to please him. This is a question about your motives. You can't settle this question 
If you can't settle this question, your faith in God is going to be hindered all your life. There's going to be a trip up every once in a while, and compromise will win at every opportunity it has. We've got to determine, and I'm here to tell you that God is looking for people today that has a sole ambition to please him and him alone. Refuse to be a puppet on a string. Refuse to allow others to dictate to you. Let the Lord, through his word, show you how and what and where you should be going with your life. Choose to please him. Can you say amen? And if you're sitting here today and you're driven to please people, to please others, and sometimes even to please yourself, it's not going to change until another's love prevails in your heart. Because most of the time we are driven because of what we love. What we love drives us. And if we love somebody else, we'll do anything to make them happy. Well, that's beautiful to a degree. But if it oversteps and now you're not pleasing God because all you're doing is driving them, what we need to do is have a fresh love. And may that love be of the Lord. Because it's funny how the very thing we love is the very thing we're motivated for. Isn't that true? Man, if you love, fill in the blank. You find the time for it. You spend the money on it. You invest your life in that thing. But man, if we love the Lord, he becomes our motivation. He becomes the one. We can't keep you out of church. We can't keep you out of ministry. We can't keep you out of serving. Why? Because your love for God. And Paul, in the midst of his talking and writing this letter, if you look in Ephesians chapter 3, he bursts out in prayer about the incredible love of God. And in verse 14, he says of chapter 3, For this reason I bow on my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being what? Rooted and grounded in love. There it is again. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth so that you would know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge and that you would be filled up to the fullness of God. The very thing that will transform your priority in life is the love of Christ. The thing that's gonna help you to get this question solved properly so that you answer it the way we wanna answer it for the applause of God, it's the love of Jesus Christ, that he would be your number one love over your hobbies, over whoever is in your relationship, over your job, whatever it might be, that Jesus would be number one. Isn't that what he wants anyhow? There shall be no other gods before me because he knows the very thing that captures the heart of a human being is the very thing we're driven for. It's got to be Jesus. It must be Jesus. And Paul knows what he's talking about because he was tough as nails. You remember? He was the one running around killing Christians. But God in his love knocked him off his donkey one day, blinded his sight, and got through to his heart so that the very thing that used to motivate Paul was transformed. Now the love of Christ motivates Paul. And Paul lived abandoned for the love of Christ. Do you see that in his life? And I believe he's saying to us today, and God is saying through his word, that we need to let the love of Christ capture our hearts in such a way that everything we've ever had passion for fades in comparison to the love that we have for Christ so that when we say, what motivates me? It's Jesus. What motivates me to do what I do? It's my love for Jesus Christ. His love has just washed away every pain, every problem, every stain, every hurt, every callous, every hard spot in my life. And I'm captured by the love of Christ. And everything is shaped around that. What motivates you? Sometimes we're motivated by people and what they might do for us. If I scratch their back, they might scratch my back. Hey, we've got the biggest back scratcher in the world is Jesus. He's the one 
that promises to care for you and to love for you, to shield and shelter your life. And you know what? This is big because he ends up that chapter in Ephesians chapter three. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. He's got big things in store for us as we allow his love to flood our life and we say, God, I'm motivated by you, Jesus. I just feel like he wants you to love him more and he wants to pour more of his love into you so that you will understand the depth and the heights and the widths of his love today because he's not here just to say, if your motivation is wrong, shame, shame, shame. He's saying, hey, if your motivation's wrong, you haven't really experienced the love. Or maybe you have, but you've wandered away. Come back like cornflakes used and try it again for the first time. Get recaptured by his love once again so that he can be the very one that motivates you in your life. And that as you serve him and you love him and you choose him, he stands and he applauds. He says, awesome. Because I kind of get the feeling when the devil came looking for somebody and kind of accused Job, I have a feeling there was some applause for Job. Here's my servant. Yeah, but he just loves you because you're so good to him. Well, you can think that, but man, he's getting it done. I want you today to make this decision. What motivates you? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Take a moment, take inventory. Like I said, this is a personal question. One you have to investigate and examine the intents of your own heart. Holy Spirit, we need your help to discern our hearts today. Maybe there's some here regardless of where you are in the journey of faith that you're on, you might realize that your motivation has been wrong and it's time to surrender to Jesus and experience his love once again in a fresh and real way. There might be some, maybe you've received Christ a long time ago or maybe you've never done it before and today's the day you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because without Christ, our motivation is others and me generally me. God doesn't want us to live our lives motivated by me. He wants us to live our lives motivated by him for others. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Is there anybody today you need to surrender your life today? You need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You need to choose to follow him because you realize you want him to be your motivation in life above anything else namely yourself. If that's you, would you raise your hand today? You need to accept Christ or recommit your life to Jesus. Is there anybody here today that's saying, that's me, I need to do that? Not gonna embarrass you, not gonna call you out, but if you need to accept Christ, now is the time. Let me ask you this next question. There's somebody here today, you need to reset your priorities. Who motivates you? And today you need to make that step of faith and say, I need to make my goal to please God and God alone. If that's you, would you raise your hand today? Some things need to change. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see all kinds of hands. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else today? You say, that's me. Some things have got to change though after this. You're choosing. Thank you. Say, God, I'm going to let you redesign my life here. I'm going to let you flip my house. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let you redesign the furniture here. I'm going to choose to begin to please you, God. There's some areas I see, thank you. I've kind of compromised a little bit, trying to keep peace. But man, I want to please you, Lord, with everything in my life. God, I want to lift up my brothers and sisters that raised their hand just now. 
They're saying, God, I've got to change what motivates me in my life. I got to begin to let you to redesign what motivates my life now so that I can gain the applause of heaven, the applause of God. I pray, Father, for each one that they would not hang their head in shame, but they would be grateful for this moment that you've allowed your word to speak into their life, to challenge them, God, but also to point us in the right direction with this very personal and practical question that prioritizes now what we would do with our life. And I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that as we've raised our hands, that this is a moment of change. This is a pivot point in our life, God. And Lord, that this decision will shape the decisions that are in front of us. Who am I going to please? Does this gain the applause of heaven? And God, may that begin to put forth good seed in the ground with a good harvest to follow. I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that they come back with testimonies and Lord, lives transform because they're pleasing you as well. And I'm asking it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.